how uh, citizens, right, are part owners in a democracy. And at the same time, governments uh, are monopolies and citizens can just take their business elsewhere if they don't like the services. So, you know, with that kind of responsibility, how do you research and design? Um, and so, Sid, hopefully we'll cover some of that. And, um, you know, you're well known in the industry uh, and the government for your creative approach to research as well as design. Uh, not just doing the design itself, but also helping you know, other people responsible for providing these services uh, do design. Um, and you know, when, you're, uh, when she's not in the office helping uh, public servants use design for good, she also mentors uh, designers and researchers um, and serves on the board for Institute for Applied Tinkering. I hope you can tell us a little bit about what that means <laughs> at the end. Uh, with that, please welcome Sid. Thank you very much, Smitha. Is this on at this yes. point? Great, have to do that bit. So nine or 10 years ago, I would have told you that I had a terrific user research toolbox. I worked at a cool little firm that prided itself on being able to answer any research question that you brought to us. We weren't afraid of the technical challenges of figuring out how to do difficult things. Studies like this one, well, this gentleman and his bulldog are participating in a study that we did in 2008 for a major auto manufacturer. They were working on a concept car for the 2009 Geneva Auto Show, and they wanted to include mobile data devices. And so they wanted to know how do people actually use cell phones and other devices in their cars. And they said, and we're pretty sure people lie to us when we ask them directly. Um, they turned out to be right about that. <laughs> so no problem, right? We were going to recruit a cohort of people who would allow us to go along with them on a trip that they actually had planned, so they'd be kind of in normal mode, with whatever kids or pets they would normally take along on this. We were going to send two researchers so that one would bring along a cellular modem and broadcast the video of what was going on in the car to the observers, who by the way were on another continent, and the other one would be able to take questions by instant message, feed them into the interview. Um, we did a huge set of photos. Some of our photo meta tags were no hands and one hand and pets. Um, and we edited a whole bunch of videos together and presented them with something really useful. And I would have said, look at my toolbox. I can answer this question. This is great, and I marched along for a few more years. This was 2008, um, figuring out interesting, clever challenges and ways to answer research questions, mostly from businesses that knew what they were trying to do for what users. And then in 2012, two things happened in pretty quick succession. Facebook, I think there might be a couple of you out there, bought the company that I was working for at the time. And I had by this point become enamored with the idea of working in civic technology. So I took this as the, uh, the little poke that I needed to move on and try to do that full time. And then I got an email from a friend. Um, I was pretty excited to get the email because the friend was and really still is more famous than I am and a, a researcher I really look up to. Her name's Dana Chisnell. She's known for the field guides to ensuring voter intent. And this was just after the first four volumes of field guides had come out. And she said, hey, Sid, I hear that you're not going to Facebook with the team. Would you be interested in doing a little bit of research? I need some more brain power to figure out how we should handle these questions for local election websites. And I said, well, this sounds like catnip for me. Um, and we started to do that study, and their beautiful fingerprint logo is there. So the government organizations that I've worked with over the last seven years, except for my current one, um, are the Center for Civic Design, which works on local elections, Code for America, which mostly works with municipalities and states, and eventually I spent a term at 18F, which is part of the federal government. And that was started uh, by the Obama administration after the healthcare.gov disaster to bring technologists of various types, engineers of course, designers, product managers, to be in federal spaces. And as I started to work more and more with the types of questions that we got, it didn't feel so much like the toolbox 
for broadcasting a live research video to Europe was all that adequate to what I was doing. And so when Nancy asked me to come and speak tonight, I thought I would like to talk about how I figured out how to answer the kind of questions that come up in government. So in 2012, Dano's proposal was that one of the second four volumes of field guides would be about election websites. Easy enough research questions. What do voters want to know from local election websites? But there was a fair amount to that. What is a local election website? I'd actually at that point never looked at my local election website. Um, a pr probably a lot of you are in the same state. Um, elections in the United States are run by secretaries of state at the state level and county level officials. And the direct administration is largely by the county level officials, except in New England, where they are run at the town level. So, we said, okay, well, we'll do remote moderated interviews. We're both very comfortable with this methodology. We should probably recruit a lot of people. And we had a conversation about whether we could pick a couple of exemplar election websites and have everyone look at those so that we would have a sort of congruency across the interviews. And we also had a conversation about whether we should give people a standard set of tasks or whether they might have what we at Volt Peters used to call passionate tasks that they would be coming to the website for. We checked with some local officials. The traffic was not enough to support intercept recruiting on the web on just about anybody's election site. So we were going to need to recruit people from all over the place and figure out a cohort. And we said, we better take a look what these things are. If we'd just been doing um, remote moderated interviews, we would have been really comfortable creating our plan, creating our protocol, getting all set up so that we could take the same kind of notes. We wanted to do a large number of interviews. And I think we ended up with 42 in the end, um, somewhat lowered by Hurricane Sandy, which happened during the election that year. But we thought we'd do somewhere between, say, 30 and 60 interviews. And so given the time frame in which people are intensely looking for election information, it didn't make sense for two of us to do them. So we were going to need a recruiting protocol. That would be pretty tight. We were going to need a synthesis plan to coordinate all those people. That seemed pretty manageable. So we need to take a look at some of these sites. This is 2012. So only HIP conferences had the sort of long single scroll site that you would expect from a lot of places now. But there's a tremendous variety in what you see in terms of what was prioritized on the different election websites. And you're looking at everything from Holmes County, Ohio, over here on your left, to Honolulu, which is a pretty big county. Cuyahoga County, which includes Cleveland, is right in the middle. That's actually one of the better ones at that time. Um, we needed to learn a whole lot more about what exactly was going on with these websites and how the officials thought about them. <laughs> but we didn't really know how many officials would be able to give us very structured answers about websites, or indeed how many of them were directly concerned with websites, or whether they outsourced almost everything to do with them, which was pretty likely. And so we embarked on a bunch of processes. Now, I want to say that the local election officials I've met in the course of this and other research are some of the most earnest public servants that I have ever met. Um, they are not worried about conversion on their website. They are not worried about partisanship, although sometimes state-level secretaries of state may be. That's a more partisan office. But the people who run elections at the counties want to run a fair election. There's this wonderful guy. Uh, from Maricopa County, Arizona, who tweets this every time any county in the country has an election day. He says, may your margins be wide. We all want it to be really clear who won. And I love this. And there is so much conscientiousness and care. These are people who, by and large, have minimal technology training, um, probably pretty strong technology use in a consumer sense, like any of us. We discovered that they, sure, you know, uh, went on social media, did banking things, you know, things that we would have considered like a, a high internet user in the late 90s. They were all doing them in the mid uh, 2000s. So one of the tricks here, um, we have a lot of governments in this country. When you say the government, you might think of the federal government. 
We not only have 50 states, we have around 3,000 counties and close to 20,000 municipalities. And that's if you don't count the regional park districts and the water districts and other administrative districts like that. So we were dealing with the 3,000 counties and then some extra towns in New England. What were we going to do about understanding what these sites were from both an inside and outside perspective? I love this particular audience because I knew you wouldn't mind if I brought you a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> so uh, we decided to try and construct ourselves a sample of the 3,000 to evaluate closely that would be pretty defensible if we ended up wanting to write an academic level paper about it. And we added in the top 25 counties, which account for about 65% of the population because we thought it was important to cover that many Americans. And then for states in which we chose only one county, we looked for the most dense county, the least dense county, and in some cases the county that most closely matched the racial mix of the state. And we made sure to include a bunch of uh, majority minority counties because one of our hypotheses at the beginning was that it was something that we should look for whether majority and minority counties were less well served with online services related to their elections. So we constructed a sample. Uh, we started out with 175 and 25 of them turned out not to have websites at all. And so we had uh, about 150 in our sample to evaluate. And we went around and around for a couple of weeks about how we were going to evaluate them because recruiting somebody in each of 145 counties didn't seem like a good idea. And we finally got an idea from Dana's husband, Jared Spool, actually, to do a structured evaluation. So we weren't to the long, scrolly paradigm of websites yet. We were in kind of mostly the three-column paradigm where you had navigation on the left or the right and you had the main content in the center. So we created a Google spreadsheet that could be filled out by anyone. We tested it actually with my mom, who is a um, fluent internet user, but not a user experience person. She's a retired doctor. And um, asked her to record, and everybody who ended up participating to record each of the headlines and each of the links in these major areas of the site. And then we went through and did an analysis and decided that that was a pretty decent proxy for what local officials thought was important to be putting on this website. We wouldn't have called it data science in 2012. Um, I'm not sure if it's exactly that. Um, but it's a kind of close reading in a structured way of what is presented to a voter. And then we decided we really should check how many of those 3,000 counties have election websites and uh, started down that path and multiplied out the hours and minutes and decided that actually what we really should do was get a project intern. <laughs> and we did get a wonderful woman named Andrea Feynman who is now a practicing user researcher um, to work with us about 10 hours a week and join all of our project meetings and help us with this. So we had a record of every single local election website in the United States circa before the 2012 election. Um, so we had these pieces of data. We had the structured analyses of 100, I think it's 47. I'm going to get the number wrong a couple times. 147 sites, a presence check for every county, and then we did do our moderated interviews. And we had to work out uh, a system where volunteers matched in pairs. Each of them took different notes in a Google form to make sure that they validated each other. One was the official interviewer and one was the note taker, but we did a check against each other. And then we did a kind of qualitative tagging roll up to see what voters were really looking for. And not surprisingly now, it didn't come out to be exactly what election officials thought they were looking for. If they even thought about what the voters were looking for at all, which is another interesting question. They wanted to serve the voters and there's a paradigm in mind in elections which um, you may think about. You register to vote. Then you get a sample ballot. Then maybe you deal with requirements like ID and so forth. Election day comes along. You find your polling place. You go there. But you basically aren't engaged until you have registered. 
All of this went towards developing a website template that better supported what the users actually preferred. Um, there's a couple of other things on here. If you know any election officials, please, please send them to the site. It has a ton of information for them. <laughs> um, it has voter guide templates, how to set up your polling place, the field guides themselves, an actual election website template with a canonical navigation that's based on this research. It's a really useful resource. It took us about six months neither of us working entirely full time on it and Andrea only working about 10 hours a week and then a volunteer corps putting in a few hours a week to come through all of this. And if I had to list everything that we used when we thought it was just gonna be remote moderated interviews, this is what I come out with. And in some ways, the most important of these is the busy work. Where they just have to do it, go find out. Um, but we were very glad that we'd done the sample construction because we were invited to present it at HCI International and then we were able to give Andrea a nice little first authorship um, on that paper. So that was really cool. And the synthesis that we did with groups of people on the phone or on video calls was a very conversational activity and it was where we got to one of our most important findings which was that people were reversed from what election officials thought. To the extent that election officials thought you got registered and you couldn't take any other step until you did that, that was not how the public thought about it. The public thought, what's on the ballot? Should I bother to go through the rigmarole of getting registered, figuring out where to go, all of that? And most of that what's on the ballot information was hidden from voters on most of these sites because they needed to know your exact precinct, to know exactly what would be on your ballot. So, and for that, you needed to be registered. And I, this was one of the places where I learned that just talking about it is a worthy activity as a synthesis, that, that having two or more people who've been immersed in a big data set sitting together, bouncing it back and forth until they stop being uncomfortable is one of the most valuable things you can do. I've had trouble selling it to commercial clients, but I've often been able to sell it to government that we just need this time. Don't count the hours. Do this. So the Center for Civic Design kept doing this kind of research. And in 2017, they published one of the most useful summaries of civic design research that is out there. It's called The Epic Journey of American Voters. This is a graphic from it. This is actually the privileged path. If you're a person like me whose parents took them along to the voting booth and reminded you to get registered when you were 18 and everybody that you know goes to vote so everybody's talking about it on election day, this is kind of what it looks like. You learn what's on the ballot first, you figure out how to take part, you go to the specifics, deal with marking the ballot, go on. If you have challenges in your life, like perhaps you're an immigrant, you come from a family where people have been restricted from voting because of court records or anything like that, it looks more like this. If you're just going around in a circle, you're often too late trying to find out what is on the ballot to actually get registered, get the IDs necessary, and follow the entire process through until you've actually marked your ballot and been counted. So that was exciting. And I decided to stick with this civic thing and I moved over to Code for America, which works mostly with municipalities. And um, we were pretty into innovative new technology at Code for America. We liked to do apps for people and we liked to figure out how to do things that were new and we were definitely not very interested on in working on websites, it's old tech. Really, everybody knows how to do it. Uh, but there was a constant question from the cities that we worked with. They would bring us in with a group of fellows to do something else. And at some point they would say, do you think you can help us do anything about our website? And so eventually we decided to ask ourselves the question, well, how can we help cities run useful websites? We don't hear good things about city websites from members of the public that we talk to. And you know, we don't see the kinds of web organizations in cities that we would see in the private sector. Cities are enormously various. So whether you're San Francisco or San Jose, um, 
San Francisco, as of now, really built since 2012 as something like a 30-person digital services team. I'm going to embarrass one of the heads of design at San Jose, who's in the front row. They have a marvelous team of people who started in government under Michelle Tong. Um, there are basically the same requirements and demands on the website of Morro Bay down south, which is about 15,000 people, as there are on the site of San Francisco or San Jose in terms of what people are looking for. So it's got a lot of dimensions to the question. We thought we'd start um, with a city close by. We started with Oakland. Um, their website was particularly terrible, and the staff were embarrassed about it, and it even went under the domain name oaklandnet.com at the time. <laughs> um, one of the toughest things that we helped them do was get a .gov address for oaklandca.gov, so that's there now. Um, and we thought we'd do a citizen survey with a pretty decent sample of people. We'd do some interviews with the city staff, and we'd do something related to analytics, but we weren't sure if they really had an analytics package or anything. These are some municipal service use cases. You probably have more touch points with the institution of government via your city than any other level. And probably every single one is kind of a challenge to figure out how to deal with. <laughs> and it actually ends up being a lot of points. If you think about your interactions with the federal government, you probably pay your taxes once a year. Maybe you renew your passport once every five years. Uh, you might have reason to interact with another federal agency or two. But you might easily have 20 interactions with your city in the course of a year, or maybe even more. When we counted it up and thought about the challenge for a website, municipal sites need to serve two or 300 interactions that nobody does frequently. And that's an extremely different information architecture challenge from, say, funneling everybody through from a catalog to a checkout or even a news site where you're segmenting content into areas and getting people to the pieces that they want. And as far as we could tell, there wasn't a model for how to do it. And uh, we got stuck. And it was clear that the cities had also gotten stuck, because this was the top now of paradigm across practically every significant city in the United States. Residents, businesses, visitors, government. And I've still never found out who sold them all this. And if you know, I'd love to know. <laughs> sort of like the person who sold the restaurant sites, <laughs> the music, <laughs> and not putting their hours on the front page. Really? Awesome. <laughs> so this is hard for people to use. Um, and here at this point, we are talking about the 20,000 municipalities, most of whom have a lot of the things that were listed in that use case list. They have a police department. They have parks. Probably have some kind of street planning. Unless they're a very small city, they pick up trash. They repair things. You can get a permit to build something. Um, how could we even figure out how to help all of those different cities where sometimes the IT department is a half-time person figure out how they could run a website that worked for their constituents? So we had a lot more research questions. What are the website teams prioritizing at this point? Maybe they know something. What does the public want and is that different from what the public expects? And then how can we even define a purpose so that we can evaluate a website that's that general? We decided at least to start running some analytics. And we put a screen with this dashboard, which was forked from a gov.uk dashboard, into the lobby of Oakland City Hall so that people could see, passing in and out for work, what pages members of the public were actually looking at. That was some interesting stuff. And then we decided, in desperation, to go out on the web and see what we could figure out about what Google thought were the top pages on city websites. So uh, this was fairly soon after Google had introduced its top pages feature for the top search result. And we managed to figure out how to get the actual city website as the top search result with a particular query. And we went after the top 100 cities by population, which gets you, I think, all the way from Los Angeles and New York down to Birmingham. Um, and uh, the least populous city in the top 100 is about 198. 
thousand people or something, so not in a completely different scale, say, from San Francisco or San Jose, but actually in a very different resource situation. Um, and then we looked at FAQ pages on every one of those websites, too, to see if we could source anything from that. We did get kind of an interesting set of topics, but it was entirely generated out of just online searching. Um, and the one that bubbled up to the top surprised us, and I'm sure it shouldn't have, because it was trying to find things in the city government and navigate how to do things. But people also looked for council meetings, they looked for officials and positions, they looked for various services and amenities, and we were able to categorize all that. And we decided that we would use our citizen survey to see if we could validate or break any of this. So we did a survey of 1,000 residents in Oakland, which is about 0.25% of their 400,000-ish population. Um, and we had a lot of concern about whether we'd get a valid sample. So we did a lot of work on placing the survey in four languages, um, the four languages that the city was required to provide public materials in. And we paid people who normally distribute concert flyers and that sort of thing to give out information about the survey, and we made sure it was mobile responsive. We knew that our networks, though, and the sort of general tech network was going to skew rich and white, and we wanted to do our best to see that it didn't. The interesting thing here is it did reinforce a lot of the things in that topic breakdown. Um, in particular, the groups over on your right, um, you know, the one at the top I think of is just kind of doing stuff in the city getting things done, dealing with things that you run into, and the bottom is all kind of professional cases. Like there were open data people, probably in our skewed sample a little bit. Um, getting a job with the city is a surprisingly big case. That's a great job in a lot of cities. Um, and so those pages get a lot of attention. And then bidding on city contracts, doing some kind of business. And we figured out that if we asked people in our survey to tell us what neighborhood in Oakland they lived in, we could do a rough match against census data about the population of that neighborhood and get a guess as to how far and how much our sample was skewing and see what we could do to correct it. So we actually built a little script application to try to deal with that problem and make sure that we got it. So if you're keeping track of what we've used in terms of skills, um, we've done online research, we've done surveys, um, we've done some aggressive recruiting methods for surveys. We've built an application to try and correct our sample. And then we realized that one of the big problems was what are city staff using to run websites and are they running into barriers? So we did long, open-ended research interviews with 16 Oakland city staff who touched the website. And we found out a lot. Um, one of the few pieces of software that I have actively called abusive in front of the people who bought it is Oracle Site Studio. Um, it does not allow actual names of pages, emails people every single time there's a status to a page, like you know, page number 67524 is ready for review, and then it says the same thing as it advances through different stages of the review process. So everyone had this entire email box full of emails from the CMS. And then, as far as whether it actually worked, it was really, really challenging. And they never saw the results of what they did. People would go through fire and water to build a web page with this system where they had to crack into the raw HTML to fix things that were wrong with it, even though they had never <laughs> thought of themselves as a computer person. And they would publish a page, and they would never see the public use it and they didn't have a user research practice, they didn't have an observation practice, didn't have a feedback mechanism on the site, and so it was nothing for them but a slog. Um, there was no reconnection. And that was one of sort of the saddest things and the ones that we tried the hardest to fix was how can we show you that your work is having an effect? How can we make your work easier to do and part of the way we did that was involving them in all this research. So these folks are actual city officials from Oakland at the time, and we're doing a facilitated synthesis session because they didn't have a lot of experience with research synthesis. Um, 
but we had them fully engaged and we did four hours together cutting up interview transcripts and highlighting them and working them into categories and talking about what we could do with the categories to then put what we needed into an RFP for Oakland to get a better designed website. So if you're counting, once again, we come through a whole lot of skills other than the surveys and the interviews that we thought we'd do in order to answer the question of how can we help cities make useful websites. And I just wanted to show these better organized because I'm that kind of person. <laughs> but these are the things that a lot of municipal sites need to do. And this is what we propose to make um, as a canonical information architecture for a municipal CMS that we ended up deciding we had to build because there was really not much of another solution. No for-profit company was gonna do it. And um, it's a bit of a sad story because it did well in early testing and then was cut in a strategic realignment. But one of the most interesting pieces of work research that I've ever enjoyed working on. And then eventually, I joined up with the federal government. Um, a funny story about that, I did it because I thought it was a good time to do it in 2016 and I figured I'd see a presidential transition and that would be interesting. And I really, really got more than I bargained for in that particular way. So the first study they put me on when I joined the somewhat nebulously named strategy team at 18F was about digital transformation. So the research question was, what are the best practices in digital transformation? And I honestly sat with that one for upwards of an afternoon and I almost went back and said, you've gotta tell me precise meanings for transformation digital and best or I can't help you at all. And when I asked a somewhat more politely phrased version of that question, they said, I don't know, make it up. Figure out something useful to do because this is funded and we are not going to shut it down. <laughs> so our plan <laughs> was definitely to do some interviews and probably something else. Um, and a lot of our work focused on refining the question because it, it it was clearly important. There are some projects that move government forward in getting better at using modern technology and there are some that aim to do that and fail. And it's likely that there are some different characteristics between them, but how would we articulate what we were trying to do? So before I describe our methods, I have to talk a little bit about where we were situated. So this is gonna be the acronym portion of our discussion. Um, the General Services Administration was formed in the 1950s from six other agencies. And it is exactly what it sounds like. Its purpose is to make things easier for other government agencies. It, because of that, it does not receive much appropriation from Congress. Almost everything it does is cost recoverable. So it consults on technology procurement. It runs buildings. Um, so here's where we lived in GSA. The PBS, one of the services of GSA, not actually that guy, <laughs> but the public building service. So they run a lot of historical buildings and office space. The Federal Acquisition Service. And at the time, an equal service was the Technology Transformation Service, although that's now been merged back under FAS. FAS gets to supervise wonderful things like the Office of Information Technology category, which is my very, very favorite government bureau name. Um, the Office of Information Technology category runs really important under the radar infrastructure pieces like Schedule 70, which are the approved vendors from which government agencies can easily purchase technology services and technology products. Um, it's a critical function, you probably never heard of it. I did some interesting research there that I'm not gonna talk about. Now, 18F was in technology transformation. And so we were a weird new agency, but when we called other people in the federal government, they said, oh, you're internal, we can talk to you. And even when we called some people in other government agencies, they said, oh, you're a government, we can talk to you. I don't think this particular study would have been possible from outside. So the research question that we ended up refining to was what makes modern technology practices stick 
beyond a single innovation project, because that seemed to be one of the major failure modes. A city, a government, will put in an innovation team and they'll do some really cool stuff and they'll show what's possible, which is a really popular phrase, and then they will upset someone. And that could happen or an administration could change and the new administration has different policies, different priorities, and it's just not a priority and the funding doesn't last. So we decided to look at, okay, what lets people get over that hurdle? How do projects work? We had to make a few assumptions. Um, I think the most important one here is that transformation is sort of a terrible name for what we're talking about. It's really continuous improvement and going from a model where you don't think continuous improvement is possible to one where you do think it's possible. Um, there is almost certainly more than one way to succeed at this. So we didn't want to write one handbook that said this is the way. And we had new questions. What does transformation mean in government? So we were able to talk about that one with interviews. And we ended up putting all of these in an interview script after the telling of a story. And the recruiting for this was some of the most challenging that I've ever needed to do and some of the most confidential that I've ever needed to do. I will never ever name any of the people who I talked to in this study and uh, their names are erased from GSA servers and we talk about them hopefully unidentifiably by their position like a, a state Medicaid official who had a uh, major procurement that five years later did not result in a launch. That was one of the types of people that we talked to. So these were in-depth, open interviews that we had to do a lot of sort of synthesizing, not structured and targeted interviews. And we started to realize that one person in each organization was nowhere near enough. So the fourth bullet down, cluster recruiting, started to be what we could do. We would get a toehold, we would talk to one person, we would try to have an interview with them that they enjoyed, found valuable, and then we would say, is there anybody else in a key position in the organization, or maybe there's somebody who's important who's a little lower down in the organization, hands on, that would have useful perspective on this. And we tried to recruit three to four people at different levels of every agency that we talked with about digital transformation. This was, in the end, really effective. We also did a literature review. Um, it's the first time I've done a literature review in a sort of user research project. Um, and the literature review was fantastic because it reminded us of a few things that happened back in the wilds of the 90s internet. Um, for example, commercial companies having all of the problems that government is having now. Um, if you remember the Christmas scandal of 1999 when Toys R Us was not able to deliver the orders that they had accepted on their website, front page news, huge problems, disappointed children, everything about the internet was terrible. It probably shouldn't be used for commerce. And this was somewhat reassuring, and it was reassuring too to the people that we brought this back to to say, you know what, a lot of sectors have gotten over this hump. Hi. This is a long report. These all reported in long, resulted in long reports, but this is the one that if you think you are interested, I've made a short URL for because it's out on GitHub and everything uh, is in there. It's probably one of the most abstract studies I've ever done. This one and um, the uh, persona study of audio files probably count as the two most abstract studies I've ever needed to do. Um, and so I think all of these three studies probably went into the study that I just finished um, this fall about experiencing self-help in the California court system. And uh, that may sound funny to you because self-help sounds almost like an experience that wouldn't be provided to you, but it's a specialist term and it basically means that you are getting help from someone but that person is not your own attorney. That's what's referred to as self-help in the court system. I 
don't think a lot of you are tweeting out, but this is current work, so I'd rather you didn't talk about it in detail. I have really high hopes that they are actually going to release this to the public after a few more months of persuasion and comfort level with it. So I'd like them to do that rather than me tonight. So here's the research question. What is the actual experience of representing yourself in the civil court system? We have a lot of people who do this. Um, close to 90% of court cases, civil court cases in California have at least one party who isn't represented. So it's a very significant segment of the public, usually in times of challenge in their life. Well, we don't know that much about it. Um, what's the civil court system? You probably learned in school about a couple of different aspects of the court system. Number one, the constitutional review by the Supreme Courts of the States and of the United States. And probably number two, about the criminal justice system, your right to a jury trial, um, all the things that go along with that. But I don't recall, and I'm curious, we can talk about it later, if any of you recall learning about the civil justice system that's available to us. So suppose your roommate stops paying their rent and starts becoming abusive. You can actually redress that through the court system. You can get a restraining order. You can evict them, depending on what kind of uh, contract you have. You can fight an eviction. If you find yourself in a marriage that isn't working anymore, you can go for relief to the courts and get a divorce. So these are enormously important things and enormously varied things. And figuring out what's the experience of getting help with any one of these things is a real challenge. To boot, the California court system is complex. Uh, we have 65 courts and 254 courthouses. And the 58 trial courts have judicial independence and they also have administrative independence. And that means IT independence. So they don't use the same case management systems. They don't build their websites the same. They have, again, highly varied amounts of resources from little Alpine County with 1,000 people to Los Angeles with 10 million. Um, and figuring out how the experience varies across those and yet is the same and what we can bring back to the court system and say, OK, if we're going to start developing better digital services for people who are representing themselves, these are the things that we need to focus on. So first, we thought we'd intercept people at the courts. Now, in a lot of government agencies that I've worked in, intercept recruiting is dangerous. Um, I've been at a few where user research is thought to be illegal, although I don't know of anywhere where it's actually illegal. Um, but the courts have been incredibly welcoming. And they said, can we come and sit in the waiting room and talk to people who are waiting to get help filling out their forms? And they very often, with our internal badges, which we have as consultants, say, yeah, sure, come on down. And uh, you know, do you want to meet with the judge after observing a courtroom? Yes, we'd love to. Um, but we ended up having a lot more research questions. And these are some of the key ones to actually figure out what's going on. Very clear, coming to the judicial branch from the executive branch, how important judges are. Um, people call them judge in every single situation. It's a permanent designation. People look up to them in every single situation. So judge somebody's views on the internet are much more important than the IT department's views. Um, and government always calls it IT rather than tech. So they mean tech. Um, so we wanted to look at how were our judges in California interacting with people who were representing themselves as opposed to the ways that they interacted with attorneys. And we wanted to know, were there any particular steps and particular processes that tripped people up that we should then focus on? Um, how did people explain legal information to ordinary people like you and me? And what, what's your mental state when you're waiting around at a court to get some help with something that is virtually certainly one of the biggest hassles in your life? Um, so the judge question was really interesting because on our first day, we saw a couple of judges just absolutely blister attorneys for minor points of stapling something wrong or not having a tie on. And you know, it's just part of the culture. The attorneys took it. But they would slow down with 
individual members of the public who didn't have representation and say, stop. I don't want you to say yes to that until you really understand the question. And then they'd explain it in a much more plain language way. And I'll be honest with you, what we've done with this information is try and feed into that sort of judge worship and excitement and say, look what the judges do. We really should follow this in our web content. <laughs> right? So if the judge is going to adjust his or her language to make it easier for a self-represented litigant to understand what's going on, we then think that that's the appropriate thing for us as the web people to do. So we had field days at court. Um, this team in various combinations went to 20 of the 58 courts in California and spent at least a full day. And having a big research team meant that we could do a lot of things. So in every single court, I just have some atmospheric photos that I'll show you in a minute. In every single court, we talked to people in the waiting rooms. We observed courtrooms where there were likely to be self-represented litigants, things like domestic violence calendars, things like small claims calendars, things like family law calendars where custody and um, parentage are decided. And we asked about the local rules. We took the staff out to lunch. We had a meeting with leadership. We sat with the clerks. How many of you know what a court clerk does? <laughs> yeah, all right, two of you. I didn't either. Um, they accept filings and they make sure they're correct and they check them in with time stamps and they also sometimes give people the right forms depending on the county. Um, the reason you don't see a courthouse in this nice team photo is because Fresno County actually has a local rule that you may not take photos either in or of the courthouse. So we took the photo in a nearby park. And this sort of encapsulates the experience of going to court and being self-represented. There are numbers to pull, there are rules on sort of Xerox signs stuck on posts and around, and there's definitely rules about what you can't do in the courtroom. And then behind the scenes, you've got stacks and stacks of paper. So much paper. These um, on your left are packets, meaning assemblages of specific forms that are used for a particular court process. So you can go down to your local court and you can pick up, say, a child custody orders packet if you want to change your custody. And that will have all the forms and then it will have a bunch of instructions written by people at that local court about how to fill out those forms. The forms are not self-explanatory. Um, that is one of the things that <laughs> we hope to work on. And most of them are not online, although there are some of what are called document interviews, where you answer a series of questions in a web form and it spits them into a PDF of the appropriate court form. It's a better experience, but it's definitely not ready for prime time at this point. So we had sort of a, come up with a side quest anyway that if we were gonna go to that many counties, we needed to figure out who had the best tacos. And we actually realized that one of the most effective things that we could do to find out what was going on was to invite mid-level staff to an inexpensive lunch and bring along some notebooks. So we started eventually somewhat formalizing that taco research was gonna happen over lunch. These were the questions we were gonna try to get answered. We asked them if it was okay to take notes. Um, and we would find out what they saw people screwing up when they were trying to represent themselves. And with our conversational synthesis, we did it over dinner. Um, we tried very hard to follow the Judicial Branch of California's um, T&E guidelines and spend $8 on breakfast, $10 on lunch, and $20 on dinner. So we explored a lot of the excellent Thai and Vietnamese restaurants of Central California, which was super fun. And we would go late, so like 7.30, and sit there for a couple of hours and talk through everything that we had done and seen that day and then have everyone contribute to a Google Doc with their top observations. So we have about a four to five page summary of observations for every team court visit, which then went into synthesis. So I thought maybe I'd share a little bit about what we figured out. We heard from many, many people that the court process was too complicated to map. You could maybe map an individual case type, but there was just no way that you could give 
a self-represented person an overview of what the stages were of going to court. Um, but after having a shocking realization five months into my engagement with the courts at one of these dinners where our attorney team member was with us, that realization was that when a judge says something in a courtroom, gives an order, that's not final. The actual party has to write that up and submit it for signature and finalization. Almost no lay people know this. This is one of the most challenging parts of the court process. There are a lot of people that have a divorce that's been open in California for two and a half years and haven't written up their final judgment and thus are still stuck married. And I, <laughs> you know, this was sort of equivalent to the idea that self-help means getting help from someone. I, <laughs> my head spun around two or three times. So the judge's judgment is not the final judgment. Right, says my attorney teammate. The parties write it. <laughs> and so I got, I don't know, frustrated, mad, interested, and went back to my best Western hotel room and started drawing stuff. And so this is a basic map of most court processes that we're using, what? Uh, that seems to be the projector, not my computer. There we go. Um, that we're using to slot, to prioritize digital services and slot them into a process. So to get something done, to get some kind of relief or some kind of something that you need from your court, you need to figure out what to ask them. This is not insignificant at all. And you know, we talked to a f some cases, most people who want a divorce know that that's what it's called, although that isn't what it is typically called around the courthouse. It's called a DISO for dissolution. Um, and, but many things, if you don't know how or what to ask for, you can't get it done. And then once you've figured out what it is, you've got to tell the court in writing. And in California, you have to tell them in writing on a specific form that is designated by the Judicial Council, the body that I can consult with, for that process. And then you have to do something called service. How many of you know the term to be served papers? How many of you know how to do it? <laughs> you can hire someone if you have the money to do so. Um, you can also have anyone 18 or over. Um, in some states, you have to actually hand it to the person and have them take it. In California, you can actually put it near them if they see it, if they won't take it. Um, but the court cannot proceed until the other party has the papers. And the papers don't just include whatever process you initiated that you filed. They include evidence that you bring to the court, uh, sometimes in the case of uh, family law, financial disclosures, and so forth. And you have to prove to the court that the other party has all the information. This is also a real challenge for lay people to understand, not because it's complicated, but because it's weird. <laughs> the court is kind of this. Very rigid. Very rigid, yes. Ritualized. Ritualized, that's a good way to put it. But it's, it's, it's not what you expect if you've done other kinds of processes. And so that can loop back around. For example, if I were to initiate a divorce against my sweet husband, who I am not divorcing ever, um, I could serve him with papers. And if he wanted to respond and say, actually, I'd like to potentially dispute with you about how we should divide our assets and what we should do with our child, he could file a response and he would have to serve it to me. Um, so you can go a couple of rounds depending on what kind of case it is and every last thing has to be served every time. So that's kind of a loop. One of the things that I learned when I started working in the courts is that a court decision by a judicial officer in a courtroom is a relatively rare conclusion to a case. Most cases settle. And in things like family law, you, there are forms for a marriage settlement agreement where you can, if you're having a reasonably amicable divorce, agree and write down what you've done, and the judge will never rule on it. But you still have to write up a final judgment to have the decree made and have it be final. And there's sort of a mini process of this, by the way, which is kind of cool, for name and gender change, which California is really great with. Or if you find yourself in the wrong name or the wrong gender, you can go to the court, you can present your reasons. Depending on your age, you might need to notify a few people. Um, you have to publish that you intend to do this so that anyone who doesn't want you to can show cause. 
And then you write up a decree, you still have to write it, and a judge will then declare that your name or your gender, whichever you applied for, is changed. You still then have to do all the work of going out and changing your driver's license, changing any other documents that you may need to change. But I only got to this after you know, 10 immersive visits to the courts at which we did all of this process around observing all of these different pieces of the ecosystem. And uh, <laughs> these are simplified instructions for proof of service on paper. Um, we are working on digital services. There is an entire paper ecosystem. Um, the body that I work for maintains 1,200 court forms. They do not employ a single designer. The forms are revised by attorneys working in groups. Um, they are earnest public servants who do their best, and they could really use the input of a knowledgeable designer on this stuff in particular. So even if we do improve the digital services, part of the challenge is can we then drive the idea of working with users, oh, I think it's that plug, <laughs> working with users, considering the actual comprehension of users as a evaluation criteria for a piece of content, whether it's on paper or on the web, as just as important as the legal accuracy as determined by a committee of attorneys. The really, really big cultural shifts that we're looking at. But they told us when we presented our preliminary report, um, which also included some really cool things like there are certain courts who have come up with service values, where they've said, if a person takes the time to get childcare, drive in, park, and spend their time at court, we want them to get the maximum value out of that visit. And just having that kind of high level service value has allowed them to then design some of their services and do things like place assisters on the same floors as the courtroom so that they can help people write up their judgments right after they come out of the courtroom and not find out a week later that there was a step they needed to do for their case to be final. So there's some really cool homegrown service design work that no one would know by that name that's happening in the court system that we're also trying to bring out. So this is our wonderful attorney teammate and she had a, an insight at one of our dinners. She said, you know, when I practiced privately, I didn't do all the things that we're asking the self-represented litigants to do as an attorney. I had a whole set of staff members who did these things. I had a paralegal, I had a legal admin, I had a process server, I could access legal couriers if I wanted to. Um, legal couriers are amazing. They're like bike messengers, but 100 times more organized. They come in with everything in binder clips and color coded and they double check and they check whether the clerk is doing everything right. Um, it's a fascinating little specialization. But I feel like what Kiana was describing and a lot of what I've talked about tonight is that the price of access to some of our institutions is really high. And in fact, you know, when you think about, okay, I've talked about government, I've talked about the courts, I've talked about a bunch of things that you might call institutions. These are things that really impact our lives because they don't just act at scale, they act over time. You might think of libraries or schools or hospitals or the institution of healthcare that can really impact people. It's a very strange time for our institutions. And I think about them a lot. And one of the things that I'm so interested to hear your questions and have some discussion about is, in this current time, we are trying to work with institutions that have maybe centuries long time scale through technologies that have years long time scales. And the techniques that we developed for user research to go fast, help people iterate quickly, figure out how to deal with the next version of the operating system, the next type of phone, the next all of that, are not everything that we need in order to help our institutions stay strong in this time of rapid change. And as I work in government, I'm coming up on six, seven years now, 
um, more and more I feel like what I'm doing as a researcher is trying to meld practices that I don't do very well from an academic source because I don't really have a full academic background with these industry practices that we think of as design research and come out with ways that people who have chosen public service can do better service, possibly using some of these cool new technologies we have. It is definitely my observation that public servants make more and more consequential design choices than the entire design industry. And so my practice has begun to shift towards making sure that anyone who is faced with making design choices has access to design practice and to design community. Never mind who is a designer, never mind even you know the detailed specifics in every case. And I think that the most important thing that we can do, those of us in this room who do this, is be transparent about what we do so that we can allow other people to do it with us, to question us, to check us, and to use it where they can use it to make things better for the public. So. Thank you, Sid. And now we'll open it up to you to ask Sid some questions. <laughs> yes, please. Hi, Michelle. Hi, hey, Sid. <laughs> um, my question actually follows uh, really well on where you ended. My question for you is, like, what is your philosophy on where the, where the sweet spot is the most, I guess, ROI for the public good in terms of teaching government public servants to be curious about their users and, and conduct their own research, uh, as well as teaching governments how to seek out and procure expert UX research services or hire professional user researchers into their organization? Yeah, so I think sometimes hiring strong researchers, if those researchers are committed to acting as part of the internal team, can be a shortcut to what we're looking for. But I also think that design research is one of the most powerful and accessible practices in design. You don't need to go back to school to learn how to do it. And so I do a lot of bringing people along as observers on research and saying, hey, do you want to do a session next time? You know, I noticed you participating a lot in that synthesis. Would you be interested in learning more about how this works? Um, I spend an enormous amount of my time coaching, showing. <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, I want everybody to be able, to, I, I want every government to be able to procure a study from that fantastic three-person user research firm that's in every big city that does really good work but doesn't typically meet the procurement thresholds because everybody needs to you know, send out a study every now and then. But I also want them to be able to evaluate the work well and participate really actively in the you know, um, plan development and synthesis phases as well. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> <laughs> or a non-definitive answer? I'm all envious of having clients who will sit still for a months long research project. Uh, <laughs> clients I've had uh, have trouble sitting still for weeks long, much less months long. Um, how do you do it? Do they just not know any better? <laughs> well, I, you know, one interesting thing is that a lot of government organizations aren't used to doing things fast. So the fact that we produced a really solid preliminary report, really it was more like four months, you know, but um, in four months was fast for them. So th there's some interesting differences of expectations in terms of time scale. Um, and there's an interesting discomfort with speed, which is sort of the opposite of what I see in the private sector right now. It's like if it's not fast, it's not effective. Um, and I think I didn't quite catch the final half sentence of your question. Oh, just, uh, do they just not know any better? Do they do just not, not know, know that? Um, <laughs> it is such a new practice in so many governments that there are almost no expectations. And it is also 
like telling them about the civilization on Mars sometimes. And I, I really try not to make it as if, you know, government does all kinds of evaluative research or contracts people to do it or works with academics to do it. But the idea of the faster type of practice that we've had in industry over the last 15 years or so feels sketchy, shaky, not enough. Um, you know, as with a lot of private sector clients, statistical research feels more solid, more effective. Um, so uh, there's a very familiar kind of showing people that the qualitative can actually provide evidence on which you can make reliable decisions. Um, we were doing other stuff during the research period too. We started prototyping some things, but I can't really talk about that yet. <laughs> but if I can augment what you're saying, <laughs> and, and that is, you know, we're coming in and we're saying we're going to help you rethink uh, how your website is organized. And as Sid says, none of these people is trained in design, so they didn't even know there was a design aspect to how it was organized or what it looks like or whether there's a picture or not. They didn't have those as any kind of dimension. And the fact that in four months' time we're going to give them some direction and that they can follow it for a really long time because they have to maintain it and that they know how to reevaluate it in two or four years. That's like amazing, right? So we're giving them techniques and not just a project, I think. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I'm Azalea. Uh, I'm a researcher as well. Um, awesome. And I was wondering, I get bombarded with research questions uh, all, all the time and deciding which research question to answer is super important. And I'm sure <laughs> yeah. you working in these large organizations with small resources must get bombarded with a lot of research questions as well. I wonder how you make that decision. Which question to ask? In some of these cases, the first question wasn't answerable. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my first criteria was, I have got to get to a question that I feel like I can actually answer. Like, what is the best practice in digital transformation? I don't know if I can ever answer that with any degree of certainty. So how can I refine that question to something that everybody agrees is a good pointer to that, but is more specific so that I can actually answer it? Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you saw Erica Hall's article from last month about research questions as distinct from interview questions. It's a really good piece of work worth your time. But I, yeah, I think getting agreement on what the research question is and what we assume about what the answers might show um, is really helpful. I insist that all my partners help write down the assumptions so that we can see if we're hitting all of them, <laughs> if we're breaking half of them what's going on there. Um, and if we have a question that's so broad that we can't really generate a set of assumptions that we all agree somebody holds, then we probably don't have a workable question. Um, and then if, it, you know, if it's something as broad as what's the experience of, getting, of representing yourself in the court, we have to think about what the components of that are. And, you know, I cheated a little bit in showing you the ones that worked out and generated useful answers. <laughs> we had a few others. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, maybe we'll try and follow all the wayfinding signs in courts and see if that works, kind of a secret shopping approach. That didn't really yield anything. We didn't have actual court problems. And so that was also me breaking one of my favorite principles, which is that someone who has the need is really the only right person to research with. So um, it's a process and having a partner helps, and having a partner who will challenge you respectfully really, really helps. So I'm curious about the audience, and who here is currently working in civic design in the Bay Area? Well, I think you guys are, aren't you? San Francisco? San Francisco. So you're in civic design, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so and Michelle. So just four or five, okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I'm Yi I'm also a researcher at a tech company. Uh, so I was wondering, um, what's the biggest challenge for you to conduct US research for government's websites or services? Biggest challenge for developing websites or services? For government instead of for government. Like com com commercial products. For doing the research about it. For doing, yeah. Um, in a lot of governments, it's getting to do the research at all. 
Um, there's definitely an impression in a number of places that it's illegal or dangerous or requires, you know, university IRB level consent forms for a 20 minute observational interview. Um, but I think, you know, just to, to go big, coming up with a shared understanding of what a quality outcome for a web experience is, is harder than you might expect in places where people haven't been accustomed to doing that. So we've been talking about it a lot in the courts, um, trying to come to a shared understanding of accuracy and legal content that allows for shorter content. It's really, really scary for the attorneys. Um, and so we've, we've had some conversations about things like, you know, one thing that seems to cause people quite a bit of anxiety is they don't know how long a case might take. Um, do you think we could provide any kind of estimated duration or typical duration or, you know, is there, is there some way that we could provide some, some time scale information? And I was surprised to find that that generated one of the biggest arguments I've had in a meeting in the last couple of years where people were clearly from their body language really, really uncomfortable with the idea that we might provide, you know, a duration that didn't allow for the 2% outlier where something hangs up for five years and it would be therefore inaccurate. And it, it makes or, sense. They're making and a promise they couldn't keep. They were making a promise that they couldn't keep. And they were, and I, and I think, you know, it attaches to inaccuracy in the law, which is a terrible thing for a lawyer. We can't have that. So it's understandable in the mental framework and it also causes a lot of problems for their users. And so <laughs> we're trying to work to a new shared understanding and it's, it's quite difficult. Um, everybody's on board with the process, but it's just not easy. So. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I, w I was expecting at the end we would see that long list of different methods. That the, the <laughs> I should have done that. Of all methods. That would have been a good idea. Yeah. Um, Next time. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Oh, actually, one was question. Fun. Oh, was, was there one more? Here. <laughs> Hi. So what was the tinkering um, center that you were talking about? The can Institute you talk of it a little more? Sorry. Can you um, talk a little bit about the Institute for Tinkering that you mentioned? Oh, the Institute for Applied Tinkering. Um, it is a radical education organization that runs a lab school and camps and enrichment. Um, for people who don't know what a lab school means. A lab school means it's a school that doesn't follow the traditional curriculum because it's doing, it's experimenting with curriculum. Um, it's a, a child-centered, project-based program, which every school says they are nowadays, but this actually is the kids can do almost anything they want as long as they do something of significant scope. So it's a K-8 school, K-12? K-12. K-12. Um, and then the camps, uh, the kids build things like roller coasters and bridges in a week. Um, so I'm a big believer in human potential at every age, and uh, that's why I'm on the board of it. Working roller coasters? <laughs> what? Working roller coasters? Um, working roller coasters? Yes, coasting? working roller coasters, not carrying a lot of people at a time, but one or two. Wow. Wooden. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. That's old school. <laughs> I've been on some. Great. Okay, let's thank Sid one more time.